Thank you for joining us for part two of the virtual artist talks by participating faculty members in the art exhibition titled Persist, Resist, Coexist, Women Faculty in the College Architecture. My name is Rebecca Pugh and I'm the curator at the Wright Gallery and a lecturer in the Department of Visualization. I'll take a moment to introduce the exhibition. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States, this art exhibition features works by 11 women faculty members in the College of Architecture. This centennial celebration, however, occurs in the midst of political and social turmoil in the US, the ongoing climate crisis, and an unprecedented global pandemic. Reflecting the urgency of these events and conditions, this exhibition includes works that respond beyond a woman's right to vote. The exhibition highlights the diverse backgrounds and research interests among participating faculty members. It is a multi multimedia exhibition that brings together painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, and interdisciplinary video. Common themes throughout the work include landscape, abstraction, and gender identity. To further our celebration of women, participating faculty members have provided artist statements about their work, listing women artists and designers who influenced them, some providing direct quotes. A digital catalog including these statements is available on the Wright Gallery website, and it also includes links to educational media online. Located in the Langford Architecture Center, Building A on Texas A&M campus in College Station, Texas, the art exhibition is currently open to the public with limited entry volume and required masks on weekdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The show is open until October 15th. To stay safe during this pandemic, today we gather virtually and welcome artists and viewers from various locations on Zoom and Facebook Live. Our speakers today include Mayat Andrewson, Haryong Sale, Lori Lizenby, and Felice House, all of whom who feature female figures in the work in the Wright Gallery. It is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Mayette. Hi, my name is Mayette Andreasen. Um, I'm currently full-time faculty in the visualization department uh, at Texas A&M University. And I teach animation production classes, game development classes, and 3D, 3D software classes. Um, I'm also the internship coordinator for the Viz department. Um, I've been teaching uh, for over 10 years in higher education. Um, and previous to teaching, I worked in the games industry as an artist, both in mobile and console games. Um, I earned my BFA in 2D animation with a minor in illustration at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. And I earned my MFA in computer arts at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, California. So up on the screen, you see um, my two final pieces that are in the show. They're called Spider Woman with Afro and Spider Woman with Locks. Um, so I personally am a self-described nerd. <laughs> I love comic books. I love science fiction, fantasy movies, animation and games. Um, but as an African American woman, I have often found that representation has been lacking in those genres. So um, I found that the introduction of Miles Morales in the recent Spider-Man movie was a huge success and, and the comics as well. Um, previously, Peter Parker has always been synonymous with Spider-Man. And with that reimagining of the Spider-Man character as a different person and a person of color, along with Miles' success and acceptance into mainstream pop culture, I and my friends uh, were really, really inspired. You know, a light bulb went off in my head and it was that anyone can be and take on the mantle and legacy of a well-known uh, superhero character. So I love this idea. And so I did my own interpretation of a new spider woman. And this is some of my process. So here's my references. So I really wanted to take a look at the costume. That really was, was what I was looking for. And there's a lot of different Spider-Man costumes. And so I kind of took certain elements from the different costumes that have been out there. 
And then I started doing sketches. So initially I thought of, oh, what if I just have her kind of lounging? And I was thinking of myself as the superhero, by the way. And so it's like, oh, she's in a hammock, she's lounging. I did some action poses. Um, I did some more hammock poses, some traditional kind of uh, standing superhero poses. And um, eventually I came up with the image that you're seeing on the right. It's like, she's kind of standing there and her spidey sense goes off. So I took that stance and I started refining it. Uh, and then I thought to myself, well, what if she had locks? And um, I actually got some great feedback from some of uh, my wonderful friends, my artist friends out there. And I said, which do you guys like better? Do you like locks and Afro? And it was really split down the middle. Um, uh, uh, one uh, friend was like, well, what if you have like wind kind of blowing through her hair? So I did a version of the uh, locks with wind blowing. I really liked it. I did a version with the Afro. I liked that as well. And so I decided, hey, I'm going to do two versions. <laughs> And uh, here we have kind of the final inked version minus the hair. And uh, it ended up being these two. So these are the two final versions. Uh, my inspiration, uh, I have a lot of artistic inspiration, but some of my women artist influences are Claire Wendling, who is uh, a French artist, and she has done a lot of work uh, in animation films and illustration. She's published several uh, books of her art. Uh, Laura Braga, um, so Claire Winling's piece is on the top. Uh, Laura Braga's piece is uh, the bottom right, and you can go to any one of their websites and, and see the work. And Laura Braga does a lot of comic book um, cover art. And then Ashley Woods, who's one of the few African-American female artists who does comic book work. I mean, there's, there's very few that um, I've been able to find. And uh, the quote I have there is from Della Hicks Wilson, um, who is a wonderful poet. And it said, darling, your soil is too rich to let words that aren't deeply rooted in your truth soak in. And that kind of drives my life and my art. And uh, that's my presentation. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maya. Our next speaker is going to be Har Young. Um, hello, my name is Ao Hua Yang. Um, it's a great honor to be the part of uh, this show. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M. Uh, I teach uh, courses related to interactive art, design, and immersive environments. My creative works explore their intersection between body, nature, and technology. I've been fascinated by the aesthetic qualities of human experience and the relationships that emerge through interaction within art artifacts, artworks, uh, the underlying beauty and pattern of the nature. Uh, many times research components um, are attached to my art practice. I often investigate how interactive artifacts evoke positive impact on the quality of experience in learning and well-being. In this exhibition, I have a recorded um, video of the project called Upwell. Upwell is a mixed reality performance um, that was created from a collaboration with the dance department and Texas A&M. Upwell allows audience members to explore the virtual and physical world with two dancers. So the image you see on the left side is a VR view. And then it was projected on a screen fabric like the image on the right side. All these lines and dots were created by a dancer, you know, who controls the VR system. And in the VR environment, um, this whole chaos image, um, you know, you can feel like uh, you're being in um, underwater. And also this pro uh, project is not created by only me. Uh, I had a VR developer and we also have a choreographer and also a music person and also dancers involved with this project. Uh, a dancer with a, con a conventional VR goggles like you know, see on the left side, um, you know, wearing the, the goggle and then also wearable controllers. Um, can navigate around the room scale virtual reality setup and interact with dynamic visual and sound elements. Since the dancer wears a custom made wearable controllers on the palm, um, she can make intricate gestures to develop direct relationships with bioluminescent particles in the virtual water. Uh, and then the other dancer only interact with the visuals created by the VR dancer without realizing 
she is uh, in the virtual world. So if you look at this diagram, the VR dancer standing in this VR performance area, and then the other dancer standing in the performance area, but they are separated by this big fabric. And then the audience members actually view from this angle. So I'd like to show you some video, um, you know, short video of the performance actually. Uh, let me see here. So as you see here, uh, two dancers are separated um, by this little, it's kind of hard to see, but it's fabric, uh, we call it theater screen. And then all the visuals are responding to the dancer behind the, the fabric. This was performed and presented at the conference called TEI, Tangible Embodied, in, uh, Embedded Interaction, last year. Okay, I can move on. Um, I was influenced by many great women artists, but Tekla Shifors was the main figure. Tekla Shifors is an educator and interdisciplinary artist based in Vancouver, Canada. She was actually my um, supervisor when I was doing my PhD. Her background in dance and computing formed the basis for her art research in embodied interaction focusing on movement knowledge presentation and tangible and wearable technologies in media and digital art, and also the aesthetics of interaction. She applies body-based somatic models um, in systems such as LABA movement analysis to technology design process within uh, an HCI human computer interaction context. The image you see on the right, um, the project called Tendril is a collaboration of work I did with Tekla uh, several years ago. I was able to experiment soft and unconventional materials and develop embodied interaction in interactive wearables. This became a strong foundation of my interactive and performative wearables. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me through this uh, method. Uh, we also presented this application, um, sorry, this project as a um, participatory art installation. Uh, we presented this in Korea last year as well. Um, this picture you see here, uh, my son is actually trying this VR goggle and controller and making his own world. Thank you so much. That was really great. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Lori Lisenby. I'm Lori Lisenby. I'm a painter of the human figure and I spent most of my career in California and Utah with a graduate degree in drawing and painting from Cal State University Fullerton. I show my work in art galleries and museums and on the left is my gallery in Utah where I've had representations since 2006. On the right is from a tandem solo show in Oregon last year. I'm an assistant instructional professor in studio art in the College of Architecture since 2016, teaching mostly painting and life drawing. So many trailblazing women artists have inspired me. My artistic roots are in Los Angeles where the legendary Betty Saar was a powerful influence on a whole generation. In her 90s, she's still having major solo exhibitions. I'm so moved by her poetic assemblages of found objects. She scours flea markets and thrift stores for objects that convey her personal and political narratives. Likewise, I find myself scavenging through antique stores for oddball items that I can repurpose as picture frames or painting surfaces and can contribute to the narrative of my paintings. Another woman artist at the top of my influential list is Kathy Colwitz, known for her powerful images of suffering during the, during the two world wars in Germany. Though she worked about a hundred years ago, her images of mothers, fathers, children, and the working class are universal and timeless. She suffered greatly. She lost a son in World War I, lost a son, grandson in World War II, and also lost her husband. 
Her art was banned by the Nazis. Her iron will and creative powers were undimmed despite these many setbacks. And in a male dominated art world, she became a towering figure in German art. The hands in her figurative works are oversized, active and powerful, anything but passive. I am so inspired by her artworks as well as by her biography. My pieces in this exhibition explore a kind of metaphorical crowning of women as a symbol of women's power. In my graduate program, a couple of professors told me two things, avoid using gold and avoid telling personal stories in your art. But the women grad students followed the credo of the 80s that the personal is political. So here I am ignoring both bits of advice in this painting, The Crowning of Sarah Mode, I am representing my third great grandmother based off her only known photograph. Two years ago, my family learned that she was African-American and her bio was recently published in African-Americans of the Rocky Mountain region of the 19th century. She has received the second to the highest number of hits on their social media and I consider her a rock star. Like many women who emigrated to the Western frontier, her life was one of hardship. She lost six of her 11 children that died in childhood. And it's not known if she was aware of the plight of her father, Captain Jesse Mode. He was a free black man in Pennsylvania, an abolitionist who worked on the Underground Railroad. He was also a sea captain who took a crew of 16 black men to deliver lumber into Maryland. There, they were arrested because of a Maryland law that there had to be at least one white man aboard a ship. Though Maryland was a free state, the intention of these types of arrests was to sell the inmates into enslavement in the South. Captain Jesse was able to raise enough money from his prominent abolitionist friends in Pennsylvania, uh, actually Philadelphia, Mayette, um, to pay the jail fines to have his black crewmates released from jail. This painting is my way of telling the stories of Sarah Mode and Captain Jesse. Part of my process is experimenting and problem solving with invented media. In this piece, I make a nod to my grandma by using her antique waffle iron as a stencil to create the golden crown with these rosette patterns. She was an immigrant from Germany who treasured the right to vote that she gained here in America at the age of 25. Her waffle iron keeps showing up in my paintings in one way or another as a kind of relic of her history and the history of our country. In most of my work, I explore the human figure in poses that are symbolic of human states of being. Hands feature prominently. I regard hands as the most expressive of the human condition, second only to faces. And of course, I am rooted in the rich history of realistic painting inherited from the Renaissance. I aim to merge those traditional techniques of realism with contemporary use of found objects. To me, this duality of two-dimensional illusionism combined with the three dimensions of physical reality is the most fascinating intersection of art forms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Our last speaker today will be Felice House. Howdy, everyone. Great to, uh, great to be here. Uh, I am Felice House. I am an associate professor in the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M University. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, the visualization department is a hybrid digital traditional arts program. Uh, within that program, I teach studio art. Um, I come like Lori from the representational painting tradition. Within that tradition, my specialization is feminist portraiture. Let me give you a one five sentence history of figurative painting. Uh, basically figurative painting is the tradition of men painting images of women for an audience of other men. Um, now, women have education and opportunity and we can paint ourselves as we see fit. The thing that we're up against is that culture is permeated by the male gaze and too often women are shown as part of the product 
rather than the consumer of the product. But there is an antidote and it's what I call the female voice. So on the left, you see an image from my hero, uh, Paula Rigo, who paints women as she sees us. On the right, you see a more traditional um, consumable sexualized image of a woman painted by uh, Malcolm Lipke. For this exhibition, um, I put forward uh, four paintings from my Faced West series. This series debuted last summer at the Museum of the Southwest in Midland. For this series, I took iconic images from Western film and with the help of the gender flip and some, um, a little bit of uh, photography, costuming and some paint, I transformed Clint Eastwood into Gabriella Eastwood. Gabriella may look familiar to you as she is a professor in the College of Architecture at Texas A&M. Um, my process involves first finding the image, then photographing a model, a contemporary woman to replace the iconic Western hero. And then using, you'll see on the right, I use Photoshop to change the hat and adjust the lighting, um, put in a different background. Here's another example of that. Um, sorry, this last one you guys will probably recognize is Barbara Klein, uh, faculty in viz and the undergrad, undergraduate department uh, coordinator. This is one of our uh, former graduate students, Courtney Brake. Um, again, image of John Wayne. I'm photographing the contemporary woman to be placed as the hero. And then on the right, I'm photoshopping um, to get back towards the original. Here's the final painting um, that I created using that source image. I'm putting this one in for scale. This is our very favorite um, Chanel, also from the College of Architecture. You'll see that the paintings are larger than life. I, I do that so that our relationship to the women, um, we are dwarfed by them. I want the audience to be dwarfed by them. Uh, here's another image from the series with the model present. She is one of our former students um, from the art minor, Molly. My paintings are representational, meaning that I paint what I see, but I also within that abstract, this detail, if you're able to see the paintings in the gallery, represents how much I'm abstracting and sort of heightening color and breaking the brush marks. So th this is my contribution um, to the exhibition. And I guess the last thing I want you to take away from these paintings is the facial expression and how much pressure is put on women, how much pressure we put on ourselves to have a friendly, a approachable facial expression. Um, I got a quote from a professor emerita uh, from Mount Holyoke, Francine Deutsch. She says, I, um, if your facial expressions are more in line with power, She's talking about women. If your facial expressions are more in line with power, not smiling, then you're often considered cold. So women have a terrible double bind about how can you be a powerful person and not be seen as cold and unlikable. The person that inspired me to kind of push into images of women as I see us that are not necessarily as digestible, sexualized, friendly, um, is the painter Paula Rigo. This is an image from her painting. This is actually a pastel, but very large scale pastel from a series called Dog Women, where she conveys all of our like animal nature. Uh, when I saw this, when I was in college in the late nineties, it blew my mind and really, um, I feel like I am one of her art daughters. Here's a picture of her. It's a very blurry picture I found online, um, but it's a picture of her in front of her painting. She's currently 85 years old. Um, she shows at the Marlboro Gallery in London. And when I was in London in 2017, I went to the gallery 
And the person at the desk said, I had just missed her. She had been in the day before. So I'm very uh, thrilled that one of my heroes is walking the streets of London. Thank you and uh, definitely go see the show. Wonderful work to see. Thank you, Felice. I will now open it up to questions. Uh, for Lori, how do you use the antique waffle iron as a stencil? Well, I tried first stamping glue <laughs> and adhesive with the waffle iron because I was going to apply gold to that, but it didn't work. So this is the fun, you know, the experimentation. So then I ended up using it as an actual, I outlined it. So I guess it's not technically a stencil. That was the easiest way to describe it. Um, I outlined it and then I used the adhesive and applied gold into it intentionally kind of messy and yeah. Mm -hmm. And is there any significance in the imagery of the bee? Oh, yes. The crown, the queen bee, <laughs> the power. Nancy Malko did a show at the Reynolds Gallery, I believe last year. The entire exhibition, I, I hope you got to see it, was uh, featuring the activity of the beehive and the, the uh, all important role of the queen bee. And uh, the catalog was fabulous. So I'm thinking about all of those things. Any other questions? I'd, I'd like to pose a question. First, I want to thank all the artists for sharing your work with us. It's so rare that we get to see the extraordinary talent that um, is represented by the women in the College of Architecture. It's, uh, it's such a great privilege to, to even know you, much less to be able to, to see your work. So thank you for, for sharing it with us. I want to pick up on something that Felice said and then uh, really pose a question to all all the artists who presented today. And that is, um, we talk about women as the object and then uh, Felice talked about the woman as the consumer. But I'm really interested in how each of you feel about your role as producer, as manufacturer, as somebody who, who brings something into the world that did not exist before. How, how, much, how much of that is on your mind and how do you sort of characterize your intellectual and emotional and creative labor in your contributions to, to this show and to your work in general? Actually think about that very frequently, Stephen. I think about those two terms, consumers and producers. And I'm very much of the mindset that I am producing objects for, for whatever purpose, you know, hopefully they're enriching the cultural landscape. They're making, making people happy who buy them, you know, whatever that is, but it's very important to me that I have a steady output and that I am creating physical objects that hopefully, you know, have something um, that I'm trying to bring to them in terms of iconic qualities and traditions, as well as, you know, this, this idea of a relic. Great, thank you. It was a really great question, a tough one. Is there anybody else that wants to respond to Stephen's question? Yeah, I'll respond. I mean, I think Stephen, like as a as a maker, like I see myself as a maker. I make things. I'm in my studio right now. I'm never happier than when I'm alone making things or or not alone making things. Um, but I I feel like sometimes I I need to digest an idea, and in order to do that, I have to make it. So like the images in the, in the gallery currently, like I want to see women as the hero. I want us to assume the woman is the hero. And so if I want to assume the woman is the hero, then I have to make that image and I have to put it out there. But I'm not even sure they're for other people. I'm making them because I get to stand there in front of this very large, intense image of a woman and watch it come into the world. And I think that helps me as a human being. Thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with, with Felice there and piggyback. I, I make um, uh, a lot of my art is kind of superhero or sci-fi based and I'm, I'm making it because I love it and I want to see people who kind of look like me 
um, who are in these roles that you don't traditionally see. And then if it brings joy to other people, that's really the cherry on top that makes me real, feel really happy because it's like, yay, you wanted to see this too. But, you know, I feel like if I just wait around for the content, it's not going to happen. Thank you. I'd like to add one thing. Um, since I'm very interested in interaction, how people interact and they interact with the work, you know, and also how uh, the work kind of like, you know, ebook, you know, kinds of conversation, you know, they make, right? So uh, when I make artwork, I don't focus too much on, you know, like women is, you know, per se, but, you know, I, I always think I'm creating some kind of environment, some kind of like, you know, space people can do uh, create their own story, their own experience. So um, always looking into like, you know, how does that work? You know, using certain materials, certain colors, certain shapes, you know, how does that really impact, you know, people's perception and experience? Um, since, you know, I'm always thinking about those. So I'm more like a producer and maker. Um, yeah, that's my uh, response. And also thank you so much, Stephen, for you know, like all things you did for, for us. Uh, he spent so much time on finding a monitor for my work. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you all so much for, again, it's such, it's such an honor and thrill to be, to be able to call you my colleagues. And so your, your work is extraordinary. And um, yeah, I hope that everybody who's watching uh, at least gets a chance to see the virtual tour. If not, stop in, slap on your mask, and just luxuriate in the extraordinary artistic talent of the women in the College of Architecture. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you to all the participating faculty members today and everybody who joined us on Facebook Live. On behalf of the Wright Gallery and the Curatorial Committee, including Chair Cecilia Giusti and members Stephen Caffey, who we just heard from, um, Phoebe's House, Chris Stanky and Karen Hillier. I would like to thank everyone and also a special thanks to Mary G and James S for their very generous Wright Gallery endowment. Again, this exhibition is currently open on Texas a and campus until October 15th. Our next exhibition in the Wright Gallery uh, will be titled A Dark One Grew Inside of Me including artworks by artist Hollis Hammonds and poet Sasha West. And that will take place October 26th to December 3rd. To learn more about our exhibitions at the Wright Gallery, please visit our website, which is also linked on our main Facebook page under the About tab. Thank you, everybody.